How many cyborgs does it take to turn on a light bulb? Just one, but it will end up being networked into 3D printers, environmental sensors, and robotic stuffed Pokemon. Christopher, turn on the Chromant. Okie dokie. I set out to slap together a one-day hack and ended up degenerating into a miserable smart home gremlin. Except instead of a home, it's a workshop, which I like to call Void Star Lab. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, you are watching a dangerous video, because home automation is good now and it will consume your life. I learned this lesson the hard way, but you don't have to. You can learn a different lesson on today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Science, programming, the infinite majesty of space. These are but a sliver of what you could be filling your brain with on Brilliant.org instead of allowing home automation to get there first. Did you know propagandists can take data that's factually true and present it accurately, but in such a way that still makes you reach a false conclusion? Well, take Brilliant's class on exploring data visually to experience this firsthand and learn to spot manipulation like a statistician. It kinda rhymes. These lessons are dynamic, interactive, and paced as fast or slow as you like. In other words, they make learning actually fun. With classes for bare-bones beginners and experts looking to broaden their horizons, you will always find just the right level of challenge. You'll be gently guided through different techniques and demonstrations until you find one that clicks, and you're more likely to reach an intuitive understanding than to get distracted by intrusive thoughts of Wi-Fi-enabled smart doorbells. Send help and visit brilliant.org slash Zachfriedman to get started absolutely free for your first 30 days. Plus, the first 200 people to escape this video before it's too late will get 20% off an annual plan. Save yourself from the smart home mind virus and build real-world skills at brilliant.org slash Zach Friedman. Home automation is a psychiatric illness characterized by installing networked electronics in every possible piece of household ephemera. It begins with a preoccupation with light switches and gradually subsumes hopes, dreams, and consumer electronics until the victim is a hollow husk whose only joy comes comes from watching a lamp's color temperature change as they enter the room. This is not something I expected to fall into. In fact, this is a niche I explicitly tried to scare other makers away from. I started a hackerspace around 2011. <laughs> A sort of golden age of hardware startups when the entire technosphere was spewing its chowder over the internet of things. A lot of folks were building their own, right? Lamps that turn on when the sun sets, garage doors that open as you pull in, that kind of thing comma, internet of. In practice, home automation was a hobbyist trap of unparalleled peril. It broke people. Suppose you want to turn off your lights while you're sitting on the couch. Easy peasy, right? You just hook the light up to a relay and control it over Bluetooth from your phone. A relay is like a switch that gets flipped by electric current instead of your finger. But this was 2012, and Apple wouldn't let hobbyists use the iPhone's Bluetooth API till 2017. So you needed an infrared remote. Children, before the age of iPads, you would watch TV on an actual television, and you used a dedicated remote control instead of smearing your finger across the screen. Every device had its own remote, and these tended to accumulate in a basket on the coffee table, so instead of stacking in another one, you could just program the whole pile into a single smart remote. You hit the button, but the lights didn't turn on, because the light switch was still off. You still want to be able to control the light with a physical switch, but a relay can't override to switch if it's off and vice versa. Things are starting to spiral out of control. So you ripped out the relay and swapped in a smart switch. You can now control this with a finger or a remote, except you couldn't because infrared is line of sight. And if you're facing the TV, the switch is not in line of sight. So you need an infrared bridge to pick up the command in a hub to control the switch. And that's just one trivial task in a single room. A full house and smartening called for special transceivers like Zigbee or X10 and an attendant armada of buses, bridges, and controllers to actually implement it. If Dante's Inferno were written in 2011, at least one circle of hell would be an uncomfortably warm McMansion, and the souls of the damned would toil eternally to turn on the air conditioner over Zigbee. I watched fellow hackers, entranced by the siren song of home automation, dash years of their lives against the rocky shore of early 21st century systems integration. A decade later, I find myself approaching terminal velocity in that very same bottomless project pit. I did didn't even want to make a project. I just wanted to turn on my goddamn lights. It all started this January when our apartment was destroyed by a flood. You've milked that apartment flood so hard. The udders are turning inside out. Wait, didn't you unsubscribe like three years ago? I had lots of time to kill during the railroad strike. 
till those turfs broke it up. What's a labor dispute have to do with trans rights? It's about trains, rights. Train excluding road fanatics. Dumb bastards, just like you. Hey, that's out of line, or should I say, off the rails? Chugga chugga f*** you. So last year we outgrew our apartment. The plan was to buy a house and renovate it as we stayed at the apartment and ran out the lease. But then it started raining indoors and we had to close and move right now. The show now must go on or we will get a teeny weeny bit for closed on. I never did and I never will get the chance to retrofit the place from bedrooms to workshop slash studios. The problem is the most important part of a YouTube video is the audio. But the second most important part is the pacing. The third most important part is the lighting and good lighting really needs the room to be constructed around it. Bright uniform light needs to flood every detail, fill in every shadow, or the camera will make my flashiest projects look more like flaccid poop jacks. So I put LED strips absolutely everywhere. Every printer has lights, the fume hood has lights, even the filament closet is lined with even more lights. These are special LEDs with a high color rendering index that helps cameras capture more vibrant colors. Compared to conventional diodes, these full spectrum strips are much more expensive, they guzzle a lot of juice, and they run way hotter. I can't leave them on 24-7 or they'll burn themselves out. So every morning, I duck under my workbenches, I fumble behind my printers, I plug in each and every one of those stupid LED strips individually one by one at a time. This is a tragically literal pain in the neck and it was not supposed to be this way. I planned to have an electrician wire up a second set of outlets that I could flip on and off from this very light switch. Well a few weeks ago when I had something far more important I should have been working on I said enough is enough. I had an ESP32 Wi-Fi board left over from the Chromance project, a few random relays from client work, and a raging case of ADHD. I soldered them all on a perf board including the ADHD and I ended up with this, two relays that can make or break circuits over HTTP. Longtime viewers know I am very, very bad with anything web related, and since Brilliant.org hadn't sponsored the episode yet, this was not going to be a learning experience. I ended up with the lamest ass web server that switched the lights on when I visited one URL and off when I visited another. I already had an old phone stuck to one of my printers from the last episode, so I bookmarked the URLs, and Viola, I had a DIY light light switch in the middle of the room that was simultaneously over-engineered, under-designed, convenient, and utterly impractical. I wasted like a day putting this thing together, and I still had more lights to control, so I blew another day slapping together another board. That one didn't work, so instead of fixing it, I threw it in a bin to deal with later. I call this protrastinating. Out of curiosity, I searched Amazon, and of course, I found a board with the exact same chip and four relays, even better than my bullshit for $11. This is why you always research your project even if you already have all the materials and you know exactly what you're building. I hit buy, they showed up, I plugged one in, I hit upload, didn't work, turns out it needs a special programming dongle. Why do you people do this? While I was adjusting my desk for better head bashing ergonomics, I heard some beeping coming from the print room. My dehumidifier was full. Brief tangent. So I have a tremendous amount of filament. It all started with my quest to test out every single printable polymer. It worsened as company reps kept sending me samples, and it continues expanding to fill the entire closet and occupy every flat surface in the entire workshop. As I mentioned in my last episode, filament degrades as it's exposed to moisture, so I have this whole room dehumidifier to remove humidity from the whole room. For some reason, the weather has been unseasonably you know, wet, uh, as if the globe were warming and the climate was changing. I wonder why that is. I now have to empty this thing out almost every day or my filament will rapidly moisten. Emptying the spin is not hard, but realizing I need to empty it is. This only beeps for like five seconds and it's not very loud, so if I miss it and I don't happen to be printing, it could be like a week before I realize I've reached moistima maxture. I could develop healthy habits and take care of my most critical equipment, or I could add a smart outlet to my Amazon order of the super special programming dongle, which I totally need for very good reasons, Lily Go. I didn't realize it, but this click would seal my fate, for I had ordered ordered the wrong model. 
So when the dehumidifier fills up, it switches itself off. What I wanted was a current sensing smart outlet to detect this and notify me over AOL Instant Messenger. But what I bought was a switchable outlet. Instead of sensing when the dehumidifier was off, it put a button on my phone's control panel to turn it off. This is, you know, literally the exact opposite of what I wanted. But my rage turned to inspiration. Inspiration when I realized this is the non-chicken version of what I was trying to do with the relay board. The phone and smart outlet were talking over Apple's HomeKit API infrastructure, whatever. Apple has a reputation for making their products proprietary, but when it comes to compatibility with other people's products, they're actually kind of obsessed with open standards. Sure enough, someone had written a very well-documented Arduino library called HomeSpan, or HomeBridge. I keep mixing these up. Uh, anyways, it turns an ESP32 board into a custom HomeKit compatible home automation thingamajig. So once that stupid dongle arrived and I wasted two more hours trying to find the bootloader button that was hidden under this rubber seal, what is wrong with you people? I modified their control and LED example to switch the four relays. And the dadgum thing worked right away. With like three minutes of actual work, I could control all four relays right from my phone. An angel alighted upon my shoulder and sang, you have accomplished your goal. Simply wire the lights into the relay board and this project is done. I do always say finishing the project is the top priority, but then again, I also always say, make more stuff, add more features, let the project scope balloon uncontrollably. <laughs> Dude, he barely had time for this project. Oh, this barely counts as a project. It needs at least one Raspberry Pi. He needs to drop another video to pay his mortgage. Or, or, he could make custom enclosures. Yeah, after making a video, he's got a wife and dogs counting on him for shelter. Why not make a video about this? This asshole bought 40 bucks of crap on Amazon and is using it for its intended purpose. How could that possibly be a 20 minute video? That's a good point. He would have to pad the shit out of it. So I fired up Fusion 360 and designed a fancy pants enclosure to mount those relay boards. Prusa sent me some carbon fiber PETG and they just happened to push their new input shaper firmware so I had to try that out. It's less slow. I put this on Thahangs for you to download for free. Meanwhile, I did a little screwing, then a little cuddling, and I can now control the closet, the fume hood, the rep rack, and the wire rack right from my phone. I made each shelf individually controllable. This is an absolute waste of time, but in my defense, it was there. Back in the day, home automation was garbage. But now, I am controlling 12 lights in three rooms with 33 bucks of boards from my phone half an hour after discovering this by accident. This is bananas. My prefrontal cortex disengaged and in flooded the ideas. I do a lot of time lapses for my videos and I've always wanted some kind of interlock to keep myself from, you know, killing the lights while a print is still going. You can't hook a printer up to HomeKit, but fellow content creator Billy Rubin include me into Home Assistant, a confusingly yet boringly named open source alternative, and that shit has fucking oodles of plugins. You can tie HomeKit gizmos into Home Assistant and vice versa. Nearly all of today's home automation systems are compatible on some level. As it happened, exactly one hour before I started setting up Home Assistant, they released a product of their very own, a hardware base station appliance device called the Home Assistant Green. I reached out to see if they'd send me one, and this box is just a prop because they only sent samples to home automation YouTubers, a niche so niche I never knew it existed. If 3D printing YouTube is a rabbit hole, home automation YouTube is a wormhole. Are you a 3D printing person watching a home automation video or a home automation nut on a 3D printing channel? Let me know in the comments. And I know I'm reusing this from the Nerf episode, but it worked back then, it'll work now, don't judge me. Your engagement with my videos makes a huge difference on how many people YouTube actually shows it to, so I really appreciate it. The Raspberry Pi 5 just launched, but they didn't send me one. It's not like I have an influential YouTube channel or something. I dug a Raspberry Pi 4 out of an old project, 
project and I DIY'd it all myself. I cannot express how easy it was to deploy Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi. You open the official Raspberry Pi flashing tool, you select the pre-configured disk image from that list, and it downloads directly onto the SD card and away you go. It was so automatic, it was magical. Don't say it, don't you dare say it. It actually does need a Pi 4. Home Assistant is a massive memory hog and a colossal CPU sucker. You know why? Because it's written in JavaScript and Python and TypeScript, which is also JavaScript. I was a little confused when it picked up a WLED instance. That's the Ergobled control software running on the Chromance. The Chromance, though, was not plugged in. Then I remembered that time I reviewed all the junk from my spam folder. I ran Ergobled strips all around my workstation, which is also in a closet, don't judge me, so I could control it with a person sensor. After we wrapped, I replaced my crappy demo code with WLED. And when we shot the following episode, I shut it off so it wouldn't glare off my heads up display. When I say shut off, I mean, I can't be bothered to log into the stupid web interface, so I unplugged it and forgot about it. But I didn't unplug the controller. I unplugged the strips from the controller, which has been plugged into the wall this entire time. Now I can control Ergobleds with zero effort, which is the best amount of effort. So I grabbed some ESP32 expansion boards, perfect for controlling Ergobled strips, opened up Fusion 360, modeled another enclosure, and even added some built-in buttons and compliant mechanisms, and I also posted that for free for you to download, and now my workshop has even more Ergobleds. Stop me before I hack again. Home Assist Assistant's first party app store has plugins to pull status info directly off Prusa Link and Octoprint, so I checked those off. Remember how I did this all to connect my printers? You know, um, There's an aftermarket plugin directory called Hacks, the Home Assistant community store, where I found integrations for Clipper on my V400, the Duet board and the Tool Changer, and even my Bamboo X1C. I was not expecting that. There's no Anchor Make plugin yet, although someone reverse engineered their protocol salad and expressed interest in tying it to Home Assistant, so if you're going to pester them, don't tell them I sent you. There are hundreds of integrations for Home Assistant. I found plugins for stuff I didn't even think was home automatable. My TrueNAS box that I used to archive old footage, I can get warnings if a disk is filling up or dying. The Ergobleds in my PC, after I installed OpenRGB, there we go. Remember Christopher, the motorized non-binary Quagsire plushie voice assistant? Well, there's a Mycroft plugin, so my PokePel can now obey my every whim. Hey there, Zach from the future here. I would not actually recommend using Mycroft. Turns out the integration barely works, and honestly the entire voice assistant project seems to have been basically abandoned for almost three years. Christopher, dim the lights in the computer room. Yeah, I thought I could make it work. I couldn't. But it just wouldn't be a Zach Friedman video if things didn't go absolutely excessively apesh. And when I returned to the dehumidifier, I stepped directly into the primate poo poo. Now that I had broken the chains of Apple Pression, I had options. I bought a few Sonoff S31s. They're not shotguns, they're current sensing and relay switching smart sockets, and it only cost 34 bucks for four of them. The manufacturer reduced engineering costs by simply not doing any. This thing is so rinky-dink. They broke out the serial port and didn't bother to write protect the chip. That's right, these labeled test points let us burn our own firmware. So I was going to model a little clip-on programming jig, but I remember to search this time, in case anyone already modeled one. I found four. I installed spring-loaded pogo pins, may have kind of glued my finger to it, added on a USB serial doohickey, wired it up, chomped it down, opened Arduino to start programming, remembered to check first. I, let me tell you what I found. I found this firmware called Tasmoda, specifically designed for this particular socket. It's got a web interface. It's got an API. These smart home hoopy fruits are so hoopy, they made a website that flashes the firmware. This GitLab page opens a serial port in Microsoft f***ing Edge and flashes an over-the-air bootloader using JavaScript. Coming back to the smart home stuff after a decade away feels like returning to a remote tribe and finding a space program. While the dehumidifier is dehumidifying, it slurps about 3 amps and when it fills up and shuts off, it slurps about zero amps. So we just log into Home Assistant, create an automation, trigger it when the current drops, and now I can get a very, very panicky email from myself when the moisture finally beats back its captor. Let's rig another one up to let me know when one of my print fails. Oh, and I've got a mad scientist knife switch. Let's rig this up as a binary sensor and set up another automation so it can turn the lights on enough. God f***ing damn it, that's all I was trying to do in the first place. And that's the story, no, the saga of how one cyborg wasted three straight weeks turning on the lights. Normally, this is where I would promise to revisit this in the future and then completely forget about it. But this time, 
is different, probably. This home automation system should come up in our next episode, or the following one depends on how well the Halloween special goes. Why? Because while I was restocking my Ergobled Reserve Gobled, I discovered a super high density strip with 144 LEDs per meter. If you do the math, that comes out almost exactly to seven millimeters apart, and seven is a factor of 42, and 42 is the number of millimeters in the Gridfinity Organizer system. And guess what? We have already buttered some of this muffin with an easy to hack Ergobled coordinator. That's right, people. Gridfinity is getting red lights, green lights, and blue lights, and joining the Internet of Things. Gridfinitargb. Nidi. I'll work on the name. If this prospect realigns your jimmies, express your enthusiasm via the subscribe button. If that sounds like an absolute waste of time, give me a hate sub. Kindly hit like, leave a comment, and download my enclosures for your cheap ass ESP32 dev boards. While you're down there, remember, you don't have to automate your home. You could spend that time learning new things on brilliant.org slash Zach Friedman and lead a worthwhile life. It's not too late. Speaking of a sophisticated network that powers Voidstar Lab, consider supporting me on Patreon or via a Thangs membership. Lab scientists Matthew Allwright, Muvlon, and Vic's great-great-great-great-grandson Vic Jr. are but a few of our radical supporters who do a better job keeping our lights on than I do turning them on. Our irrationally generous collaborators include Turner Zay, E to the I Pie, Schleppy the Schwagster, What the Chuck, SXP, Dysfunctional Potato, The Benevolent Misanthrope, The Suits Ruined Our Fun, Bitrock Caster the Catboy, and Chris. I am so sorry I forgot to mention you last time and the previous time. Please forgive me! I've made them permanent parts of Void Star Lab and hid their names somewhere in the very video you've been watching this whole time. <gasps> Did you know this entire script is just buying time to avoid having to thank our lab assistants support? Supporters. Well, I am out of time to filibuster. Thank you, Moonkin, Trump did nothing wrong, Town Democrat Socialist, and a pretty righteous dude, Dash Sack, Ortonus Nyerb, Vigeli, Azunda Wielder, Iron Heater of Shrink, Good Suck, The Antifa, Cullen J. Webb shouts, A few bad apples spoils the whole bunch, My dog is a bear, SKL, Cody, Sunbird, Cat, Circle Zero, Lydia K, Matthew Arrington with braces, Oh, maybe he's an orthodontist, Travis Hippaw, Mulan Splooge, Shane Frederick, Bradley Carter, Agent Maxwell, Granville Schmidt, Rusty Flute, Anthony Evans, Eddie, Iron Rain, Curse. Christy Wales, Harbinger of the Hamster Harvest, Hallowed Hand of Hades, Powerful CCH, Elite Giant, Cacophony of Failure, visit omah3dprints.com for all your 3D print RPG product needs, Dennis Kempen, Cameron Ogletree, Martin Titonium, 6A, 6F, 6E75, Viwatch, Bumtickly69, Period Clots, even Bluetooth has a right to repair, Brad Cox, Bob Dobbington, General Buck Turgidson, Burn Duck 3, Bill Schooler, VPS Data, The Cuttlefish, Dax Dastardly Seek, Seth's Checks, Rinry, Max Lux, A Backstabbing Barbarian, my man! Spire, Amanishi, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Craft Computing, Farka, Big Bird Tommy, What Goes Bump in the Night, Cock to Birdman Bill, Cliff Henning, I Inspire the Next Layer's YouTube channel, so you guys should check it out. I also was recently on the Infill podcast, so you should definitely check that out. Kermit the OG Frog, Bob Forbes, Cindy Lauman, Blamo, Jason, Protagonist, Doom Crew Inc., Nuclear 314, Quality Doggo, Sox McGox, Miranda, Nathan Johnson, in bed, Pussy Nugget, Topher, Call Sign Carrot, Sticks Like the River, Not the Band, Trans Rights, the k 2 ktj Quantumly Tingled, Kevin Graff, <laughs> for the homeless, I gotta tell that guy to change his name, I'm gonna get the sh** <laughs> monetized out of me. Probably not three raccoons in a trench coat, my husband watches, and now I am too, so hi to me and urge. Incognito, Xanforian, RJ Dipcord, 603, Microwave, Glitch, McConnell, Blue Screens Harder Than Windows, Me, Scroto Sagans, Mike Kelly, Onyx Plague, Creamius, Creamy McCreams, creamiest creme creamatory. Cross threading is just free Loctite, double the threads, double the strength, you sick f Dr. Mrs. the Merman, Adam Birch, Acorn, Samuel Roosh, Thunder Chicken, Boulder Creek Yard, James, Michael Roche, DBD, King Shaming Walrus, Haley Kerman, Hi Lexi, Stormy Design, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Dempsters, The Lizards Are Watching, Zach, Zach, that was two names, Juicy Legend, Drinker of Juicy Legendary Fruits, The Monk, Michael, Noah B. Johnson, Micah, look at me, I'm a high-powered Manhattan ad man, Friedman, Zach Harvey, Carnamon, not a dig. Digimon. Measure once, cut twice, re-glue, cut again. Aaron Steers, Paul Gibbs, Aaron Han, Lykulo, Nova Ren, John Loves Jin, Steven, six foot six figure, six pack Schulte, Bryn, six foot five figure, four Lauren Wolf Schulte, Jamie, burn it, Bootsy Von Poopstein, Danny, devoid of life, Zapf, but seriously, ladies, gentlemen, cyborgs, every name I just read out loud is fake, seriously, on with the real subscribers. That's it. End of list. There are no real subscribers. Immersion shattered. You are now acutely aware that you are watching an iPhone while you're taking a shit.
Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the future. Christopher, fade to black. Christopher, fade to black. Christopher, Christopher, oh god, I f***ing hate you, Christopher.